Hello, this is a video on hypothesis testing, specifically the statistical nomenclature that we're going to use. Now this is going to be the first of probably 30 videos illustrating the theory, the practice, and everything to do with hypothesis testing. And again, I'm keeping it in a playlist called hypothesis testing. So first let's look at the null and the alternative hypothesis. You know, ultimately, we're interested in an unknown parameter called theta. And it lives in a parameter space called omega. And it can be represented like this. Now, omega can be partitioned into two distinct subsets. We're going to call them omega 0 and omega 1, such that the, you know, the union makes up the entire parameter space. Now, our goal is we must decide whether the unknown parameter lives in omega 0 or lives in omega 1. Now let's let H0, and often called H0, be the hypothesis that omega lives in, or theta lives in omega0. And let's let H1 be the hypothesis that theta lives in omega1. And it's written like this. So the first one we always call the null hypothesis, and the second one we call the alternative hypothesis. Now it's kind of arbitrary how we pick these, right? This one could be up here and it'd be called the null, and this one we'll put second and be called the alternative. But as we progress through this playlist, I'll provide strategies on how to pick the null and alternative hypothesis. Now, we have what's called simple and composite hypothesis. And if theta naught, contains one point, and this is in parentheses because I could just replace it. So if theta naught contains one point, then H naught is called a simple hypothesis because it deals with one point. Otherwise, it's called a composite hypothesis. Now, the statistical test or procedure, very generically, it's the procedure that we use to collect data and decide between H0 and H1. And the decisions that we'll make, and I'm being really vague here, we're going to use the phrases accept, reject, do not reject, and every uh, statistician has their favorite way to say this, and actually in some certain situations it's more appropriate to say one or the other. Um, I tend to say reject and accept, and then occasionally say do not reject. So reject the null hypothesis, in favor of the alternative, meaning we accept H1, that type of phrase, but more as we go. Now the data, we assume the data that follows some distribution and has an unknown parameter. And really, this is the goal. We're trying to guess about that unknown parameter. And again, the parameter lives in the parameter space, omega, so theta is in omega. Now, the the sample that we collect, x1, x2, x3, xn, can be thought of as a vector. And I think of things as column vectors. That's why I put a tick here. Um, and it lives in the sample space. So all possible samples live in capital S, and it's called the sample space. Now, the critical region, of, or often as often called the rejection region, <coughs> So let's let C1 be a subset of the sample space and such that when the sample we take is in C1, it's an element of C1, we reject H0 and accept H1. Now let C0 or C0 be a subset of the sample space, disjoint from C1, and when the observed sample is in this subspace, or we accept H0. So if it's C1, is it's in, you know, if the sample's in C1, we accept H1. And if, if the sample's in C0, we accept H0. Now we're also going to create another set called C2, which is part of the sample space disjoint from C0 and C1 and when the sample is an element of C2 
we randomly decide whether to reject H not. Now that sounds so weird, but that'll make more sense. It's called a, a randomized statistical test as opposed to a non-randomized statistical test. Now these three sets need to make up the entire sample space. And pretty much everything we do, C2 is going to be the empty set. It's not going to be relevant because randomly picking between H0 and H1, in my mind, is kind of silly, but theoretically, it's kind of fun to think about. So we're going to add it in there. Now the test function, it's a function that is between 0 and 1. Now a non-random test function has two possible out, or values, 0 and 1. So if the sample lives in C1, it's a 1. If the sample lives in C0, it's a 0. And we reject H0, which means accept H1, if phi is a 1. We accept H0 if phi is 0. Note in this case, we have to set C2 to the empty set. So these two subspaces make up the entire sample space. And phi, um, usually, so often we just write it like phi, but I want to illustrate that it, phi is actually a function of the entire sample. It's of our data that we collected. Now, a random test function. Oh, also, I've, I've, in books, I've seen instead of phi, they use delta, but I'm going to use phi. Um, the, the random test function is it, it's phi, and it's also a function of our sample. And if, it's, if our sample is in C1, it's a 1. If it's in C0, it's a 0. And if it's in C2, we call it a gamma. Now, if phi is 1, we accept H1, which means reject H0. We accept H0 if it's 0. And we reject H0 with probability gamma if phi is gamma. Okay. Now, the types of errors that we can commit, and statisticians are not <laughs> always the most creative people, they call them type 1 error and type 2 error. And if you think about it, so the true state of nature could be one of two things. H0 is true, H0 is true, or H1 is true. But if we, if we say, if you know, we collect our data and it says H1 is true, you know, we accept H1, but really H1 was, or H0 was true, that's an error, right? These are mistakes. So we wrongly accept H1. That's a type 1 error. We wrongly accept H0. That's type 2 error. So when H1 is true, but we the data sort of indicates H0 is true, that's a type 2 error. Now, last page, and this is a continuation of the types of error. Let's let H or theta naught be a point in this subspace, theta 0. And if we look at the expected value of our test function, under assuming this is the true value of theta. Now remember, phi takes on three values, 1, gamma, or 0. And so the expected value of a discrete function is the, it's the value that it can take on times its probability summed over all possible combinations. So it can be a 1 with the probability of it being in that set, or gamma with the probability of the data being in C2 plus zero times, and I, so I left that one off. But this one is, remember we're assuming that theta is H0, but this is the probability of accepting H1. And this one is too, the probability that we reject H0, meaning accept H1. So this is really the probability of a type 1 error. 
the expected value of phi under the null hypothesis. So now let's let theta 1 really live in omega 1. So we're assuming the alternative is true and it takes on that value. So the expected value of 1 minus phi, assuming theta 1 is the true value. Now so the values that this can take on are 0, 1 minus gamma, and 1. Now it takes on 1 minus gamma times the probability of observing that, which is the probability that our samples in C2, times 1 times the probability that it's in C0. Now, so this is, this is the, the probability that we accept H0, and this is the probability we accept H0. I mean, when it's in, um, you know, probably that our samples in C0, probably that our samples in C2, but we do not reject, so we accept H0. So we've, this is the probability of accepting H0 when the alternative is true. So this is the probability of a type 2 error. Now other common notation for this is beta, and then you put the, the test function and the true parameter, and if the test function's obvious, then you leave it off and just say beta of theta 1. And then if everything else is obvious, you just say beta. And so beta is, is associated with the probability of a type 2 error. Now, some of you have a background in the statistics already. And you might say, well, wait, wait, isn't this alpha? You know, the size of the test or the significance level? And the answer is no, because we're assuming that a specific value is true and often the null hypothesis it, it can be alpha if this is a simple region you know there's only one value in it then then it is alpha but generally that's a composite uh, subset you know it's a composite hypothesis so we have to do one more step which I'll show you now so the significance level of a test or the size of a test is the supremum of over all possible theta in the omega zero of this expected value. So you pick a point in theta zero, find the probability of a type one error. You pick another value in theta or omega zero, find the expected value, and you do that for all possible theta in omega zero. And then you take the largest or the least upper bound. And that's what we call alpha, right? So if there's only one value in here, then that would have been alpha, right? But you have to take the supremum over the entire uh, omega zero. Now this is the least upper bound of all type one probabilities. Now the power function, uh, this represents the probability of correctly rejecting H0 for a given value, for a given theta that lives in the alternative region, right? Power is one minus beta. Beta is the probability of a type two error, it means you accept the null when you shouldn't have. So one minus it is the probability you accept H0 when you should. So that's the power. Now power is the expected value of phi, assuming that theta one is true. If you go through, you know, what we did, but assuming theta one is the correct value, that is power. Um, now we're going to introduce notation called pi. Pi deals with the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, right? But you need additional information with it. It's so, you need to know what the true value of theta is and what our test is, our test function, in order to calculate power using pi. Now, sometimes the test function is obvious, so you just say pi of theta zero. Now, uniformly most powerful, and this is the last thing we'll cover, is you let phi be a test function of size alpha and let phi of i be any other test with size at most alpha. 
Now, if the type 1 error associated with phi is always less than or equal to the type probability of a type 2 error associated with any other test, for, and this is for all i, and theta has to live in the alternative region, right? Because we're, we're dealing with power, so we're assuming the alternative is true. Then phi is a UMP test, a uniformly most powerful test, right? And you can also think of it so the, type, the probability of a type 2 error for phi is less than any other possible size alpha test. But if we were to um, times this times 1 and then add 1, we get this. But 1 minus beta is power, which is this. And this is power. And so the power of phi is always greater and equal to the power of any other test, phi i. Okay, well, that's all I have for this. I think this playlist is probably going to contain, I would guess, 30 plus videos illustrating all of these uh, theoretical concepts. We're going to do it with examples. Uh, probably prove things a couple different ways, and that'll make more sense as we go. So I hope you enjoyed this. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.